Good morning and welcome to the BCP, uh, BCP uh, Cabinet uh, today. I'm very glad to have you have you with us, um, and uh, also to anybody who's who's watching this uh, watching this online uh, or catching up on it later. So so welcome. Um, uh, we've got the housekeeping uh, document, but Sarah, are you able to um, take take us through? Thank you. Good morning. Please note that this meeting of the Cabinet is being recorded by the Council for live broadcast and will be published on the Council website for a minimum of six months. Please could everyone present follow these ground rules. Only speak when invited to by the Chairman. If accessing via Teams, always turn on your video function when invited to speak and state your name. Please use your microphones when speaking and please mute or turn off your microphone when you're not talking. If accessing via Teams and you would like to speak on an item, please do so by utilising the raise your hand feature in the bar at the top of the Teams window. If a vote is required on any issue which is not unanimous, the Democratic Services Officer may call out each Cabinet member's name in turn, starting with the Chairman and Vice Chairman. Please respond with for, against or abstain. For those in the room, please note if the fire alarm sounds, please exit the building by way of the nearest available signed fire exit route and make your way to the ground floor of the multi-storey car park. Finally, please ensure background noise is kept to a minimum and mobile phones and other devices are turned off or switched to silent for the duration of the meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. OK, so moving to uh, agenda item one. Do we have any apologies? And uh, we've got foot to the house today, so... Just apologies from Councillor Brooks. OK, Councillor Brooks, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and then item two, declarations of interest. Anybody like to declare any interests? No, thank you very much. So move on to uh, agenda item three, which uh, confirmation of minutes, which I'm proposing. I believe Councillor Broadhead is, is seconding. Thank you. Um, does anybody have any, we, we've all had these um, uh, with us to read. Does anybody have any comments on the, the minutes? No, thank you very much. I'll take that um, uh, as unanimously supported. Move on to agenda item four, which is public issues. Um, there have been no petitions submitted on this occasion, but we do have a question by a member of the public relating to agenda item six, which is the Council Highway Inspection Policy, and nine, which is the BTP Local Plan Issues and Options Consultation. Um, and statements have been submitted by two members of the public in relation to agenda items eight and nine. Um, so now invite um, Sue Chapman and then Melissa Carrington to read out their, um, their, their statements. Thank you. So if uh, Sue Chapman could um, start, that would be great. Thank you. Is this a statement or the question? Uh, Sarah, I believe we're doing the, the, the statements first and yeah. then we'll come to the question. Yes, that's fine. Yeah, uh, it's the statements okay. first and then we'll move to the question. Thank you. Okay, the list was first, but that's fine. Um, Ignoring their terrifying climate report of 2411-20, which is still negligently and incomprehensibly unshared with the public, BCP's prospects, positivity and pride are clearly, clearly out of kilter with the environmental literacy required to protect residents from untold suffering. Egregious political and media leadership is genocidally failing to incentivise the wholesale radical behaviour change required to decarbonise at speed and scale and retain a habitable planet. Harriet Stewart-Jones' excellent echo letter yesterday points out the BCP needs to step up with a plan to communicate, educate and serve all planet, nature and humans. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, if we could move on to the second statement. Thank you. Government has recently set a new target for CO2 reduction of 78% by 2035 and committed to reversing biodiversity loss by 2030. However, after recent global heat waves, wildfires and surface water flooding, even scientists are shocked by the speed of change. We need urgent action on climate resilience and emissions reductions. BCP Council's lacklustre response is unfathomable. Even after doubling the budget for climate, the amount is inadequate. Where are the policies to encourage area-wide emissions reductions? 2050 is too late. 
most of the reductions are required in the next 10 years. Every month of delay counts. Measure what matters. Thank you very much for, for that statement. And now could we please have um, the question from Sue Chapman? Thank you. Thank you. Local plan objectives need updating. They are aspirational but meaningless given the unambitious carbon neutrality ahead of 2050 statement. Clearly, the wide range of evidence gathered at the public consultation is out of date regarding impacts now visibly accelerating as climate approaches dangerous tipping points and feedback loops significantly earlier than anticipated, an existential threat. The next bit's about um, number six. The decision impact statement final report, Highway Inspection Policy, admits the proposal does not account for the potential impacts of climate change, flooding, storms, heat waves. How will BCP inform, incentivize, and motivate residents through the diminishing window of survivability before our home planet becomes uninhabitable? Thank you. Brilliant. I believe um, we've got uh, two responses to that. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I would like to thank Mrs Chapman for her question. National planning policy requires that local plans contribute to climate change mitigation and adaption whilst planning for development that the area needs. We recognise the role that the local plan has in influencing a range of measures to reduce carbon emissions, contributing towards meeting both national and local net zero carbon targets. The objective on climate change sets the scene to adopt a proactive strategy to tackle climate change impacts, whilst other objectives set the overarching approach to promoting a sustainable pattern of development that will be key to reducing carbon emissions. A range of policy options identified in the draft plan will be developed further to form detailed policies on implementation, which will contribute to the aim of carbon neutrality. For example, promoting a brownfield first approach to development that maximizes urban potential in sustainable locations, energy efficiency in buildings, reducing the need to travel, supporting accessible local commercial centers, promoting green infrastructure, and also promoting cycling and walking routes and facilities. We have also recently reviewed our car parking standards to promote lower car uses in those sustainable locations. But of course, all that comes next. First, with the um, uh, document that we're hearing today, we want to hear the views of the community and encourage people to engage in the local plan consultation process to make their thoughts known about these key issues which will shape the future of BCP. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Broadhead and uh, Councillor Anderson. Mark? Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I'd like, again, I'd like to thank Ms Chapman for her, her, her question. Uh, the proposed inspection policy seeks to harmonise BCP Council's response to the National Code of Practice for Well-Managed Highway Infrastructure, which is concerned with identifying immediate safety defects on the highway network, rather than network improvements and changes which would allow for response to wider factors, including climate change. Inspectors do identify drainage defects through their scheduled inspections and follow up public reports. Whilst the inspections themselves do not result in direct changes to the drainage system, all the data gathered is used to inform investment strategies, including the recently adopted highway asset management strategy and information is also made available to the flood and coastal erosion team to support future decision making. BCB Council is progressing our climate action plan, flood risk management strategy, air quality strategy and highway asset management strategy, all of which will inform our activities to respond to the climate change challenge, including our engagement with our communities and other businesses. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Anderson, uh, Steve Chapman, I believe that's the, the your your statements. Thank you. Uh, okay, so then we move to um, agenda item five, which is uh, recommendations from the Ovian Scrutiny Board. So I'll uh, bring in Councillor Councillor Bartlett. Yes. Good morning, Leader. Good morning, Cabinet. The um, uh, we have got a couple of recommendations for you this morning, but I, I, I think uh, uh, until we reach that item on the agenda, which essentially is agenda item nine, I believe. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, uh, Councillor Barlett. Great, we'll, we'll do that. OK, so uh, moving into uh, the further agenda, then we've got agenda item six, which is the Council Highway Inspection Policy. 
um, which I believe is being presented by um, uh, Councillor Mark Anderson. Mark. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, the purpose of this policy is to harmonise the inspection policy throughout the conurbation, reducing from three separate inspection policies into one. It's also to ensure we meet our responsibilities in line with the code of practice. This is also the means by which we maintain pre-existing infrastructure in a serviceable and safe condition. It's not about network changes, new infrastructure or resurfacing. It should be noted that this policy incorporates changes to the code of practice, to move away from measurement based intervention to a risk based one. This is shown in the risk matrix on page eight of the policy, and this provides a flexibility based on risk and location rather than having to rely on metrics. Inspections are carried out monthly, quarterly or annually, dependent on the asset. It's also worth noting that at any one time, there are between 750 and 1,000 repair tasks in the system, and the work is constantly being reprioritised subject to new risks. Currently, there are multiple routes for reporting, including web, email, phone from the legacy authorities. These are being consolidated as part of the Council's transformation programme into one reporting form, and would like to encourage the use of the online reporting tool as this is the quickest way of getting the defect raised into the system. Finally, I should also note that this policy provides BCP with a statutory defence against third party issues. So therefore, Leader, I'd like to support the two recommendations at A and B in this report. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. And I believe, uh, Councillor Green, Mike, you're seconding the paper, Mike. Uh, thank, thank, thank you, Leader. Yes, uh, very happy to, to second this report. A few months ago, we took through Cabinet um, the uh, the highways and asset highways uh, asset uh, management plan uh, pro strategy and policy, and this is the way to to actually put those into effect um, by coming out with this plan. As Councillor Anderson says, it is a move towards a risk based approach, which is required of us statutorily, as are the other two um, items that I spoke about. Um, and is also very much the way that we would have wanted to go in any case. So I'm very happy to, to second this paper. Thank you very much both. OK, do we have anybody uh, wishing to speak at this point? No, we don't. OK, so I'll, I'll, um, I'll move to the vote then. Sorry, Councillor Bartlett, I do apologise. I've uh, forgotten to uh, ask you if you wanted to, to speak on this paper. I, I don't believe this is one where there are formal recommendations from, from the board. Uh, Councillor Bartlett? Yeah, the, no formal recommendations. Uh, essentially, the the board were content with the report. Support it. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, there, great. Okay, so in, in moving to the vote, all those in favour of the report, please show. Fantastic. That is uh, that's um, moved unanimously. Thank you. Uh, okay, so then that moves us on to agenda item seven, which is the progress in delivering equalities across BCP um, twenty twenty one. Uh, page. What we're going to do first here, so I think I'm, I'm proposing this and I believe uh, Councillor Mike White will be will be seconding this paper. Yes, what we're going to uh, do now is share, we've got a very brief um, a, a video with screen on, um, uh, just as a bit of a flag to what we'll be trying to do more as a, in our you know cabinet and council meetings going forward is improving how well we're um, uh, effectively becoming more open and transparent as a council and, and um, making some of our papers a little bit more uh, uh, visible, readable, etc. Uh, and part of that is how we can sort of overlay some um, video support, which then enables us to, to push on social media. So, um, so hopefully we'll be seeing some, some more uh, of this work coming forward. Bear with me while I, um, while I share my screen. OK. Um, with Sarah, would you, would you have, if in that case, you have to share your screen? Okay, thank you. Not everyone in Bournemouth, Christchurch and Paul feels they're treated with respect and fairness by others. We believe that is wrong and want our 
communities to be places where everyone matters, feel safe, can achieve their full potential and participate in public life. So we are working with people and communities to ensure that they are at the council. We've produced an equalities footprint to bring about specific actions to meet specific challenges. This allows BCP Council to be the driver for change as we recognise that equality is the core element of our work. We are committed to demonstrating respect for difference, to creating an environment which people can live free from prejudice and discrimination, whether they live, work or visit the BCP Council area. Thank you. Thank you very much. OK. Um, I don't think you have some echo there, but um, move forward. Uh, so, firstly, those everybody in the, in that slide presentation was was in uh, was in BCP effectively. So we're really uh, uh, pleased um, to to be displaying some of that. Um, I'll now move to Councillor Bobby Dove, who's our lead member for um, lead member for equalities. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. We're, we're just, we're just, I just want one minute, Bobby. We're just um, sort of sorting out the, the the issue we've got with the sound. Um, okay. Great. So um, we're moving forward to our lead member for equality, so bringing this paper uh, forward. Uh, I'll just say one of the first things that we did as administration was, you know, uh, make sure we did have a lead member for equalities because we absolutely key is placing an fairness for all um, and ambition for our people at, at the heart of this administration. So, so Bobby, thank you very much for the work you've been you've done on this paper, and um, I'll, I'll over to you to introduce it. Thank you. Thank you and good morning. And I just wanted to start by expressing my sincerest thanks to the leader of BCP Council, Councillor Miller, and bringing this paper forward. It's certainly unlike any other paper we've seen previously. This administration is putting people at the very centre of everything we do. Whilst the equalities agenda is the overriding purpose of this paper, it's important to understand that this paper is not directed at them over there. We all have protected characteristics which are intersectional. We all have a sex, a sexuality, an age, a race, potentially a religion, and so do those that we love. So this paper is about all of us, and it is for all of us. The paper sets out, crucially, the ambition of what we as members need to see in these early days of BCP Council's formation. It is ambitious and it's aiming to reach the very highest expectation of excellence. But Councillor Mella sets out a strong and powerful message that we need to review, to assess and change how we carry out our business as usual. Sets out a strong message that we're not any longer paying lip service to the equality's agenda, but instead we are striving to bring about a fundamental change for those who work, live and visit BCP. Now, traditionally, this paper would be more reflective and it demonstrates the activities that the Council has carried out over the past 12 months in order to meet its public sector quality duty. There, but, and there have been some seismic events in the last year and the Council has really taken the lead in meeting these challenges set before it. And the examples could include the response to COVID and in particular the support for the vulnerable, Black Lives Matter, Reclaim the Streets, and of course, being instrumental in the rollout of the vaccine programme, especially in supporting communities who are more vaccine hesitant than others. So instead of this paper backwards, I'm really pleased to see that there is a huge emphasis on what this administration will do for the future and what it will do for its residents. And I'm really pleased to see that this administration brings about the introduction of the equalities footprint. It's the blueprint that sets out how this council will engage with those that they serve and how we will keep our residents at the very centre and the very core of everything we do. It puts people at the heart and it conducts its business, how it makes its decisions, and more importantly, it uses the voice of our residents to inform our future plans. And the paper is about fairness and it's about representation. It's about removing barriers so everyone feels they're treated fairly. It's not about gimmicks and fancy sounding words. Instead, it's about the doing and it's about the application of inequalities, ensuring that it sits at the very core of our everyday business. So this paper shows and demonstrates that this administration for BCP Council will absolutely be the driver for change that we want to see. 
and it sets out a strong message and example to other organisations with easy to adopt practices which they too can implement. So as I started saying, this paper is um, for everybody. It gives everyone hope regardless of their protected characteristic. It commits to using the voice of our residents in its decision making. It commits to being a council which will be representative of our residents. And it commits to being a council which will understand our residents and their needs. This paper brings back fairness and it's a paper for you, for me and for all of our residents. And I fully support this paper. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, you know, Kat Stuff. That's, you know, and, and I'll just put a record of my, you know, thanks for the work you're doing on it and the, the leadership and, uh, and the passion you're bringing to, to it as well. OK, uh, moving forward to uh, cabinet debate now, um, I'll bring in first uh, Councillor Mike White. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. I'm very happy to second this and uh, would just like to say a few words as portfolio holder for children's services. I mean, this is particularly important in the children's arena, right through from birth as on into um, education and indeed into adulthood. And uh, already several of our key strategies and plans are aimed at reducing inequality. I'm thinking particularly of the children and young people's plan that we have and also the send and inclusion strategy. Uh, so I very much welcome the adoption of this uh, equality's footprint. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor White. OK, do, do I have any other members of Cabinet wishing to wishing to speak on the paper? OK, Councillor Haynes, may. Thank you very much, Chairman. I, I really do welcome this strategy and I know that it is a uh, organic document and it will actually just be worked on as things change and as communities move on. But I want to particularly um, talk about, and it is mentioned on the top of page page eight of the strategy about violence. Um, we have now to date, we have a domestic abuse strategy in place along with the delivery plan, which is now being enacted. Whilst I acknowledge that domestic abuse does affect people of all genders, it is more biased towards women that it happens to. So there is a strategy in place to provide the help and the support for the, fem the females who have been affected by domestic abuse along with their children, and they may be male or female children as well. Um, so that's, that's in place. We also, as a council, work very closely with colleagues under the Community Safety Partnership, which primarily, primarily are people from Health CCG um, and the police. We also have the probation service on board. And as part of the piece of work that they're doing there, we are also concentrating on some priorities, which is violent crime. And violent crime will include things such as a rape, which is extremely traumatic for women, um, and other sexual violent crimes. We also have, as part of that, we introduce uh, at the start of this month a PSPO, which entitles our authorised officers as well as police officers to confiscate alcohol from anyone who's appearing intoxicated and therefore likely to either commit an antisocial um, action or indeed a violent act against a, a woman. A woman. So that's actually now in place to, to help. So it's all part of a package. And as part of our Cleaner, Greener, Safer campaign as well, the violence against women and girls is actually a substrand within that, which we're very actively working towards. So as I say, it's a work in progress, as is this strategy document here. And I really, really welcome that. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Haynes. I've got Councillor Rampton, then um, uh, Dunlop and Kelly. Uh, Karen. Yes, thank you, Chair. I'd just like to be very brief and just say um, I certainly support this paper. In a question really to Councillor Dove, which is that will this paper um, be produced in different formats? And I'm thinking in particular easy read and, uh, and different languages where I request it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karen. Uh, uh, Bobby, can I call you back in? Yeah, um, absolutely. And it's key that we um, produce this in various formats. After all, it is a paper for those who live, work and visit BCP. And the key is to make it accessible 
COVID showed us in particular how valued a range of written information in various formats and languages is key, and it proved to be really successful over the last 12 months. So therefore, we will distribute this in its adapted versions via our Community Quality Champions Network, which is comprised of the many groups and people across our areas. Thank you, Karen Rapton. Thank you very much. Thanks both. OK, so uh, move on to Councillor Beverly Dunlop. Um, Bev, you're joining remotely. Oh, thank you, Chairman. I've got a little connection this morning, so I'm going to keep my camera off if you don't mind. Um, I love this paper. It is unambiguous and it's unequivocal from the get go. Uh, exceed our duties. Uh, what could be a better strap line than that? I think if we took that strap line through to everything we do, we wouldn't go far wrong at all. Um, there's a couple of a, a, points that I'd actually like to draw out, if I may, and they're uh, really contained in the, it, it, it's something that I think these are two points I think people need to really um, consider. And, and the first one is when it talks about in recent times, progress on equality has stalled, and in some cases it's actually begun to reverse. I think as someone who has um, in their life actively demonstrated in support of civil rights and equality for marginalised and discriminated groups, it's not only shocking to me personally, but it should be a massive wake-up call to us that we need to take positive action to protect <laughs> Excuse me, all our communities. Um, and this paper is setting out that commitment. Um, these are the difficulties of being at home. I'm sorry, I'm in isolation, having been pinged. Um, the other point that I think is really important is how equality is often misunderstood. Uh, people assume it's simply like having a level playing field and it's just not the case because some people can't actually get to that playing field um, because if they have a disadvantage it's not their fault or society is actively discriminating against them and some people have those multiple disadvantages and I love the illustration at the bottom of page three that that demonstrates that um, people start out some people start out with huge disadvantages and I, I truly believe that it has our job to eliminate those disadvantages and get everyone to that level playing field. And I think the paper puts a stake in the ground and it makes a big statement about our values um, and how seriously we take the matter of equality. And, and I really would like to congratulate Councillor Dove and Mr Johnson. I know he's on the call for an excellent paper and it's a meaningful plan that I am really proud to get behind. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Dun Dunlop. It's usually my children embarrassing me on remote meetings rather than dogs, but uh, yeah, uh, glad, glad to have you. Glad to have you speak on it. Um, okay, we've got um, uh, Councillor Kelly Jane. Uh, thank you very much, um, Leader. Uh, yes, um, I want to echo everything that uh, Councillor Dunlop has just said, uh, particularly about the diagram on page three. Um, I think that's really helpful. In fact, the whole paper, the document with the paper is is so easy to read and um, full of really interesting points that we need to to take on board. Um, and it describes our values and our ambitions to give all our residents the opportunity to reach for the stars, whatever their background or circumstances. Um, we're doing a lot of strength based community work now um, in, in this administration and we're rolling it out to other uh, departments as well as the communities uh, team and this is exactly how we see the members of our communities across BCP. We're there to provide support when needed otherwise to enable people to help each other to thrive and flourish. Equality of opportunity is absolutely key to success and as our communities are at the heart of everything we do I'd like to congratulate Councillor Dove, the Equalities team and everyone involved in the writing and the production of that paper, which has the potential to change lives for the better in our area. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Kelly, it's great. Uh, Nicola Green. Thank you, Leader. Um, I'd also like to um, start by thanking Councillor Dove, um, but it's uh, slightly different. It's for the robust challenge that she gives us um, internally, um, that when we commit, when we start any piece of work, we ask not only what are we doing, but who are we doing it for? And is there anybody that we're not doing it for? 
Um, and I find that a, an immensely helpful um, challenge that, that we all face early on, and it follows through all the work and the development of all our papers. I wear a number of hats um, in which I find this very helpful. Um, as portfolio holder for public health, um, uh, I found it um, really helpful in, in ensuring that we do extensive work via the Trusted Voices programme, which um, Council Dove has referred to, um, always working with those communities that we don't necessarily reach through our more conventional channels. Um, and it's, it's really been of immense help um, in providing access to, to support um, through the pandemic and particularly through the recent vaccination programme. I've worked with our Department for Education advisor to undertake an appreciative inquiry into inclusion practices across all our schools. I will be bringing forward recommendations to ensure that all our children have access to good, inclusive school places. But these aren't just words, Leader. These are backed up by the £10 million worth of capital investment that was brought forward as part of our budget in February. And lastly, as, health and, as Chair of the Health and Wellbeing Board, we work with a wide range of partners within the health community, particularly GPs um, and the hospitals, as well as the um, Clinical Commissioning Group, to ensure that we reach into all our communities, and particularly in pursuit of our twin priorities of tackling food insecurities and mental health. And this paper just wraps around all that work and brings together everything that we're about. So fully, fully supportive of the paper. Thank you, Leader. Thank you very much. Uh, brilliant, Councillor Green. Thank you. Um, um, Councillor Anger Mohan. Thank you, Chair. Um, just congratulations, big thanks to uh, colleague Bobby Duff on the paper, full support. Um, equality and inclusivity, just um, um, having the portfolio that includes culture and um, seafront tourism and sports and leisure. Probably I have a collection of things, obviously a collection of things where it's perhaps more obvious than in some other areas where um, where we are managing to be inclusive and where equalities is in a sense performing well and where it's not performing well. Having said that, there's a lot still unseen that we've got to improve. Um, but literally, I think when we first took our current roles, I was struck by a very, very powerful, valuable in the you know extremely uh, strong input from councillors Dove and councillors Dunlop that was so welcome on the Pool Museum projects and I'll just pick on a few examples where what was already a good piece of work done was strengthened beyond belief by an input there in terms of how from an equality sense it could go considerably further and for good reason hence we delayed it coming to cabinet and then when it came to cabinet it was in a considerably better form and suddenly we were on the right footing with it. And again, credit to my colleague councillors and also credit to officers involved, Michael Spender and others, because just to go a little further with the example, that was one particular example where there was some depth done in terms of what inhibits people being able to come and to access, and whether it's things to do with physical mobility, whether it's things to do with literally the time available, and one example here was carers, where literally they could not get out or be available to access these things because of their work commitments. And then others, a more intangible um, feeling of apprehension of going into sort of, you know, in inverted commas, highbrow places like museums, or a feeling that they don't belong or wouldn't be welcome there. And we've got, uh, this is a long, there's a long way to go with these kind of things, I've got to say, but I think it's oriented the right way now and we're on a good path with that one. The cultural compact, of course, we are putting together and we've got to continue and embrace the things that we've just talked about with Pool Museum across the conurbation to make sure that we're absolutely doing this the right way. Seafront, we're kicking off a consultation in the news at the moment, of course, and already, and I don't want to prejudge where we'll end up with people's views, but I will expect a strong view, views coming forward, that in a sense, how are we making it open, welcome and available in the broadest sense to everybody and not just those who are sort of used to being there and they know what to do. Um, I'm reminded recently, just because it's been more in the news, how, for instance, in our sporting venues and in the open countryside, how it just tends to be a certain sort of type of person or a certain genre who goes in the out, out, outbound for walks and so on, and how distinctly certain other groups do not go out there. And that's something probably we've got to get our heads around. Um, but, and I've touched on the sports and access side. That's something, another strand of work, where we've got to be as serious as, about that as we are 
with the cultural side as well. So absolutely welcome this paper, but it's almost I'm feeling here, um, if, if the right word is sort of challenged, um, healthily challenged, um, that we've got so, so much to do, but, but uh, this is a great launch. Thank you. Thank you, Mohan, and, um, and thank you all the uh, cabinet colleagues who, who have spoken on the paper. I think it's really interesting how, you know, we, we, from the depth of, you know, the speaking from various different angles just shows how this really you know, is and needs to be and needs to remain a golden thread effective what we're doing and really putting fairness uh, across all of our, our, our strands of work. Um, uh, Bobby, before, just before I um, so, um, uh, finish off, is there anything you would like to uh, like to add in terms of summing up? Um, thank you. Um, I would just like to finish off by thanking everyone for their support. This is a staff member, staff network groups, the community, and of course our ND officer, yourself, um, leader, all feed into what it is that we need to produce and why it is that we want to produce it. And um, this paper would not have come about in the way that it has without everybody's input. Um, so thank you very much. Great. OK, thank you. So, yeah, a a absolutely. I just echo that, you know, it's about fairness, ambition for our people, our place. Um, you know, we, we also appreciate there's a, there's a way to go. There's, there's more to come as well. So um, so thank you very much. Do I um, have anybody else wishing to speak before I take this paper to the vote? I'm not not seeing that. OK, great. So um, all those in favour of the, of the paper as put, please show. Thank you. That's great. We have that as as unanimous. So uh, thank you, Cabinet, for your for your support. Uh, we will move forward now to um, item number eight, which is the uh, quarter four performance report, um, which is for, for me to um, uh, to propose. Um, and, and in doing so, look, this is a, a report we regularly have um, to, to give everybody uh, the, the introduction of it. It, it states um, every quarter we do uh, performance against our, our, our key deliverables. And there are in, um, and then any um, uh, effective um, areas that we fall below our, 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 you know, the standard set effectively are shown. So that's in the appendices. We haven't, we have a, a, a few of those. Um, the performance across the board is, is generally improving, uh, which we'll be able to see in the detail of the paper. Um, not all, but a lot of the um, the areas in that appendix report are um, uh, partly because of the impacts of, of COVID. So I think it's a you know it's, it's a useful document, um, and I'm very happy to to present it, and we'll, we'll keep doing so quarterly. Um, I believe uh, Councillor Broadhead, you're okay to um, to, to second. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Very happy to second. This, as you've said, this is something that we uh, bring to Cabinet very regularly. I think it's uh, really important that we keep these uh, key areas under review and so that we can get these these constant updates about how things are going. Um, as, as you've referenced, we've been going through, well, hopefully this will be the last of the performance reports that where we'll be able to say that we've been living under the, 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 the pandemic and under COVID, which invariably affects things. But actually, as you said, the direction of travel certainly seems to be the right one. There are a few areas, and I'm sure we'll hear from colleagues uh, about the, the progress that have been made in, in those areas that have been flagged up, uh, but we are in exceptional times. Uh, and uh, in the context of that, I think um, it's it's good to see um, that there's some progress in, in the number of areas. So uh, happy to second the paper and look forward to hearing from any of the colleagues that may wish to explain more about the uh, individual areas. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, this did go to uh, the overview of the scrutiny board and um, had a, a really, I, I thought, a helpful discussion. Uh, Councillor Bartlett, can I bring you, you, you in to, to comment, Steve? Thank you, Leader. Uh, firstly, can I say that the board uh, really liked the form format of the report. In particular, they liked the exceptions report, which made it very easy to read. Um, generally, um, being made through a very difficult period, there was only one item I think that really caused genuine concern, and that was the um, the minimum um, amount of mandatory training for staff, council staff members. Uh, although it was noted that it has improved since the last report, but it's still relatively low against the target that's been set. So I just flagged that up, although I think you did at the meeting give, give a response to that, saying that was on your on your hit list, so to speak, uh, to, for improvements. So I think that's it, really. Thank you, Leader. Yeah, thank, thank you very much, Councillor Bartlett. And I, uh, it, I think it's really helpful to take that to, to have a view and scrutiny regularly. And uh, I was pleased to you know, offer an opportunity to sit with your colleagues and uh, and uh, look at how it, it can be further improved as well. So I believe that meeting is being diarised. 
Um, okay, thank you. So, do I have any members of cabinet wishing to uh, wishing to speak on this paper? Okay, go first to Councillor Haynes and Councillor White. Thank you very much, um, Chairman. Um, I want to really speak um, and provide a bit more detail on the um, information we have before us on the performance or performance is probably not the right word, but on the data that we have before us for the levels of antisocial behaviour. In the footnote that goes with the report, it does say that a proportion of it, nearly up to 33%, is attributable to COVID related uh, breaches. So things like people people feeling that in supermarkets, people were not wearing masks. There was lack of social distancing on along the beach areas and, and that sort of thing. So while it is, I acknowledge that at the time when we were in the height of the pandemic, that did matter to people and it was a concern for them. So quite rightly so, they have actually reported it. But those types of um, perceived antisocial behaviour is not part of what we would do, what I would classify as our normal, um, an action that's happened that's actually then impacted in a detrimental fashion to someone else's life. So say, for example, um, someone gets assaulted, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, which, which is actually a lot more serious in its nature. So I'd like to say that actually we have got plans and the plans are work in progress. I did mention about the Community Safety Partnership of which we are a key partner in there. So we work very, very closely with the police and as a result of our joint working with the police, there are several operations that the police are now running. We saw very recently that Operation Relentless, which is to tackle antisocial behaviour, that's been launched. And then in the lower gardens in Poole, there's Operation Fireglow to deal with um, antisocial behaviour in the lower gardens, particularly during the night time. And then the equivalent in Poole, key where it's called Operation Nighttime. There is also, which has uh, had quite a bit of media publicity, Operation Sandman that operates from Sandbanks right the way through Canford Cliffs, particularly in the beachfront areas. We also have, as part of our summer response, uh, we have invested extra resources into youth engagement because we recognise that with the pandemic, not quite there, we, you know, there is still concern that families are probably less likely to be traveling abroad. And so therefore, the younger people within the family may not actually have uh, be able to partake in the activities that they would normally be doing because they've gone abroad or gone somewhere on holiday. So we've actually put some provision in to do the youth engagement bit and to provide activities for the younger people. Um, I think one of the other things I would also like to point out is that as a, as a council, uh, we work on the evidence that's before us. So therefore, I would actually encourage people to actually report officially to the council. Whilst we do have awareness raised about certain issues that are ongoing via social media, be it Facebook, there are lots of various different Facebook groups, or on Twitter, um, it may actually cause a delay in any action being taken because it hasn't actually been reported through official channels. So I would strongly urge members of our public uh, residents to actually report correctly because if we have sufficient evidence and there is an overwhelming need to actually address a certain uh, issue that's arising in any area within our conurbation, because we have the evidence base, we can actually form a strategy. And it's actually makes it a little bit more difficult if it's anecdotal because it's actually been posted on social media. So I would actually encourage our residents to continue to actually report. Um, it is a work in progress. I'm not saying that we are going to rest on our laurels because we're attributing uh, up to 33% of the current, uh, the latest figures to 
COVID related. It is, we are aware that it is a, a priority for us, but it is also a priority for the new PCC. So we are working jointly with the new PCC and the police to actually deal with um, the numbers that are before us there. Thank you. Thank you very much, May. Um, that's appreciated. Uh, Councillor White, Mike. Yeah, thank you, Leader. I'd just like to comment on a, a couple of items on children's social care. Um, if you want to look at where they are in the report, I'm referring to the Brighter Futures charts, which are on page 119. I, I'd like first to comment on the exception report on social care repeat referrals. Um, we've got a quarter four figure of 32% repeat referrals. Uh, two comments I'd like to make. First is that it does take a long time to reduce this number. Quarter four refers to January, February, March this year, but the figures actually include data going right back to April, May, June of 2020. So it takes a long time to roll things out of the, 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 uh, the measurement. But we are on an improving directory. Third quarter last year, we were at 35% repeat referrals. By the end of March this year, it was down to 30%. And by the end of June, it was sitting at 27 percent, which is very close to our statistical neighbours um, who are sitting at about 25 percent. So we are very much on, in, on an improving traje trajectory on that one. Uh, also, a couple of other items which I think are, are very positive news. Uh, the percent of children in care with long term stability over the period has gone from 54 percent up to 77 percent, uh, which is getting towards where it really ought to be, and also the percent of timely decisions for children needing a social worker has gone up from 76% to 93%. So there's some, uh, there's some positive news in there. Thank you, Leader. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the progress on that. I've got um, uh, Councillor Green, uh, Nicola Green. Thank you, Leader. Just a, um, a, a couple of comments really on the um, the exception report about children missing out on education um, and it's to be honest it's slight, it's unclear at the moment whether this is a trend or a covid outcome you know we are we are well aware that there are um, some children whose um, anxiety about attending school has been um, increased and indeed whose parents anxiety about them uh, attending school has been uh, has been increased um, and i think we will we will be, better be able to understand that um, uh, quite soon. I think it's clearly a rebalancing underway as life returns to something that's a bit more recognisably um, uh, what, we, what we're used to. And I think that may well reduce that, these numbers. However, children missing out on uh, education is a serious issue and it does remain an area of focus. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's well on the radar. Yeah, very much. Thank that. Um, thank you. Mohan, Councillor Anger. Thank you, Chair. I'll comment quickly, please, on the uh, museums. And uh, it's a fairly round number there, which is zero uh, for the outturn. And um, of course, they were closed. Um, so the story here is, a, in a sense, to describe is a simple one. Uh, but I wanted to make a comment to, to praise those involved. We have a number of venues and link back to my earlier comment about equalities and generally the cultural scene. And I wish to sort of lift off with the cultural compact. But we've got um, uh, within this heading of museums, we have the Lighthouse, we have Pool Museum uh, in no order of importance, Russell Coates, Red House, Regent Theatre, Shelley Theatre, Highcliffe Castle and Upton House, of course. And first of all, the great headline is all of them are still going. And if we look across the country, there have been some casualties across the country. So I'm delighted to say, and this is great credit to all the officers, all the associations, all the groups of volunteers involved and all of the contributors, donators, funders in all their forms. Great credit and thanks to all of those people that we are coming through, hopefully touch wood, the, uh, the sort of coming back up again out of COVID and we still have all our establishments intact. So really, I would like that to be noted. Um, they reopened on the 17th of May. That was the earliest we could because museums and their like were seen to be at sort of the high risk end of not being able to distance and not being able to ensure COVID safety, uh, despite the fact that actually rigorous measures were being put in place, um, similar to libraries, of course. But actually, 17th of May, they had to wait. And of course, they were all ready. And again, credit to the officers and groups of volunteers involved who literally flexed this way and that way to make sure we could reopen on time. 
Also in the tune of gratefulness, we are grateful to the Culture and Recovery Fund from the government. Great use was made of that money. Um, there's something there which probably throws up as a question for us going forward, the income and cost model for all our arts establishments, because once again, that's been, it's been thrown in sharply into the spotlight as to how we ensure the sustainability of our cultural venues. Hopefully we won't get to another COVID episode again, but, I'll, uh, but something about the resilience of these establishments is something that I think we is, is a lesson to carry forward. Um, but I think the main headline here is, is thank goodness they're all still there and with our fullest support. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, thank you. And I'll just echo that as well. I had a great visit to Paul Museum recently and was you know, hugely impressed. Um, OK, do we have any other members wishing to speak on this item? OK, not seeing that. So um, we'll move to vote. All those in favour as a report, please show. Thank you, which is unanimous. OK, thank you for your support, again, colleagues. Uh, OK, we're now moving to uh, agenda item nine, which is the BCP local plan issues and options options consultation. So uh, move to Councillor Broadhead to um, to speak and propose. Yes, thank you very much, Chairman. And I know that we've got a few recommendations coming from the overview and scrutiny board um, in, in, a, in a moment. So I'll, I'll deal with those recommendations when they when they come in separately uh, and uh, particularly the, the second of those recommendations is, is very welcome and uh, on that note I would just like to thank the overview and scrutiny board for their uh, not just the extensive work they did in the, the most recent board meeting last week but also we've got the local plan working group which is a, a kind of a side function of the ONS board who have really got stuck into a lot of the uh, the the options that we're having to consider as part of the local plan process. They've taken it very seriously. People have parked personalities and politics at the door and, and I'm very, very welcome um, of that and we'll continue to work closely with them as we move forward. Um, Colleagues, this is uh, this is a really exciting paper because this is the opportunity now for local people and local businesses to have their say on what I think is one of the most important decisions that we've, we've got before us in, in, in the short term, because this is looking at the local plan, which will cover the next 15 years of, of what our place is really like. Um, because as we all know, the local plan is, is predominantly focused on the built environment, but it's actually the built environment, the things you can touch and how uh, where things go and where things are built and how the roads operate that really reflect our ambition uh, and what our area actually is. Now, there's, there's two ways you can go about the local plan process um, uh, the consultation process. Um, our colleagues over in Dorset um, have different, similar challenges, but, but different in many ways. They took the decision to prepare essentially a draft of the local plan and to go to consultation on that to say to people, here's what we think we should be doing. What do you think of those thoughts? Uh, we've taken a very different approach here. We, we clearly have um, a lot of opportunity, but a lot of issues that we'll have to consider as part of the process. And rather than going with our version of what we think should happen and asking people what they think uh, we've we've done it the other way and we've said um, we really want to hear your views um, from both public and, and businesses um, to then help us to curate and reflect those as we do the next stage will be the strategy. So to be really clear, this isn't the local plan that we're talking about here. What this is are the, in a very broad headlines um, and, and high level a, a, a basis, some of the opportunities, some of the issues, some of the challenges and some of the decisions that we will have to face in the next stage of the local plan process and saying to people with those broad headings, give us your guidance, give us your flavour, give us your views on the direction that we should be going. And um, there are some broad choices in there, you know, a couple of examples, uh, you know, we have some quite punchy um, uh, figures uh, for uh, due to the population growth, which I'll talk about a little bit later after we hear the recommendations from overview scrutiny because there are ways that we can handle those but no matter what comes out in the wash with that we are a growing area and we will have to build new homes and that will bring challenges for instance to our green belt now there are different ways to challenge to 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 uh, uh, look at that uh, we could protect our green belt by directing the bulk of development and regeneration into our more urban areas that's one choice um, there is another version where people would say oh actually we we prefer more um, a green uh, more homes in the green belt rather than our urban areas because we could have a chance for more affordable homes I know what my views are on that, but we're really interested to hear what the, the public views are. I can probably guess because our, our green belt is very, very important, but we really have to listen to what people think on that. Um, the local plan will also deal with issues such as our economic prosperity, where we want our economic zones of growth to be, 
um, we're a very big tourist destination. Where should our tourist areas should be? And we've got further pieces of work coming through uh, around things like our hotel and visitor accommodation uh, strategy, um, which will direct you know, which areas should be more residential, which areas should be more hotels. But again, we need to hear what, what people think about that. And then finally, of course, and probably most importantly, our natural environment and green spaces. As we're looking at uh, the curation of the area, we want to make sure that we enhance and protect those green spaces uh, and our natural environment. But we've got to do it in a strategic way that really reflects what local people think. Um, so this document that we've got, which will be going out to consultation after the summer, we'll, we'll talk about those broad headlines and, and seek local people's views on essentially the direction of travel and what is important to local people. Um, there's a lot more work that will be done um, after this piece of work will, that, that is happening. We'll then be getting down to the uh, the kind of the nitty gritty of actually preparing the uh, the strategy and the local plan. Uh, this is a long process. It's probably another couple of years left within the the local plan process, but. Act one, scene one, we need to hear what people think about some of the, the very high level decisions and opportunities that we will have to make uh, and then hopefully feed that into the process. So that's a, a little bit of a background of, of what the document is. Um, the detail is in the paper and then I will, um, if it's all right, uh, Chairman, come back to the points, uh, the recommendations from overview and scrutiny after. Thank you. Great, thank thank you, and and I'll I'll, I'll bring the uh, chair of overview and scrutiny in. Just before I do that, uh, you know, just to, I, I, what I fully support is the um, the, the consultation first approach we, we, we're taking with this. You know, we made a commitment as an administration that we're going to put you know residents very much at the heart of the council. So absolutely endorse the the, the way you're moving forward with this. Okay, um, so this this was uh, taken to overview and scrutiny, um, and uh, I'll bring in Councillor uh, Stephen Bartlett. Um, Steve. Yes, thank you, Leader, uh, and thank you, Councillor Broadhead, for your comments regarding the local working group, which indeed did work very, very hard on this paper. I'd just like to point out that, that the representation on that working group was divided fairly equally between the three geographical uh, different locations within the Columbation, i.e. Christchurch and uh, Bournemouth. Uh, so all areas had uh, an input in, in, into the work that they did. Um, uh, I think the, the document did change to the better during that process, but there are obviously things that had to be presented to the, the main overview and scrutiny board, uh, and two recommendations were made, and these were subsequently uh, endorsed and agreed by the, um, the overview and scrutiny board, although I have to say not unanimously, uh, but certainly by a majority decision. Um, uh, the first recommendation related to the use of the expression city region in the document. Uh, now that led to two sort of areas of concern. Uh, one in that there is not a city within the BCP area and therefore the term city region was considered maybe to be uh, a little inaccurate and maybe misleading. Although this view was not supported unanimously across the board, it was a majority view, as I said. Um, and so the, 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 uh, the recommendation on that particular item was that the, the word city be removed from the document so that the vision states we aim for Bournemouth, Christchurch and Paul to be the UK's newest region brimming with prospects, pro positivity and pride. Of course, the other element of, of the concern, I have to say, was that the use of the city re region as a was used as a description of the ambition of the council, and that this could result in a move towards the loss of the individual characteristics of uh, Bournemouth, Christchurch and Paul. So there was a concern that, you know, that uh, the city sort of uh, idea would uh, subsume those, those individual characteristics of, of, of the towns within the conurbation. And, and that's really the essence of, of the recommendation. Uh, the second um, recommendation related to the methodology uh, regarding the calculation of the numbers of houses used um, in the report. Now, the, um, the government um, require councils to use the standard methodology data of the year 2014. Um, and the concern was that this leads to an overstatement of the houses required or indeed needed. Um, 
other methods can may be used to calculate uh, the housing numbers, but this has to follow a housing needs assessment to demonstrate that exceptional circumstances exist to use a different method. If this is done, the housing target is likely to be significantly lower than that identified using the standard method methodology. And, and I say significant, the figures we've looked at, it really is a significant difference because the, the end result of that could be that we'd be looking at areas for development where, where, where we actually would not need to if we can demonstrate uh, that exceptional circumstances do dictate a different method. Nevertheless, um, uh, you know, th this has been talked about for quite some time and we've, we've, we've even discussed it in full council, but the recommendation emerging from that debate um, from the board is that to reflect the portfolio's holder statement at full council on the 22nd of June 2021 in response to a question regarding the use of the standard methods 2014 data, Cabinet should await the initial findings of the housing needs assessment, which will then be considered at a further meeting of the local plan working group before the issues and options document is put out to consultation. The housing needs assessment will provide vital information to feed into the consultation relating to the housing need within BCP. Cabinet will delegate any changes to the local plan consultation document to the head of planning and the portfolio holder, taking into account any recommendations from a working group once it has met to discuss the findings of the housing needs assessment. Uh, so those are the two recommendations. Um, I think the rest of the consultation uh, document it, it is, 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 uh, does invite opinion, and I think that's exactly what the portfolio holder was outlining a moment ago. They want to get people's ideas, and that was fully endorsed by, by the Overview and Scrutiny Board. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, thank you very much for, for, for that, Councillor Panda. Um, so shall I come back to you to respond? Yes, thank you, Chairman, and thank you very much to the Chairman of the uh, View and Scrutiny Board for the um, explanation of those uh, two recommendations that have come forward. I'll, I'll deal with them in turn, if I may. Um, the, the first one, which is uh, you know, a, a pretty long argument, actually, over the, the use of the term city region, um, if I may, Chairman, I think m m slightly um, uh, exaggerated. Um, the, the city region is a term which has been used um, certainly by government um, to reflect the very nature that as a you know extended urban area we are half a million people um, and it is pretty much um, a, a common term that it is used not just to reflect our area but also other similar areas uh, which have similar kind of geographies and, and population sizes and actually you know I also may say that the term city region has had previously uh, cross-party support. It was adopted by the previous administration and indeed the, the previous leader, Vicky Slade, continues to use it in her LinkedIn profile to talk about the area that she used to lead. So I don't think it's really a, a political argument. Um, it is something that, that government use. Uh, it is reflective of, of the area that we absolutely live in. And I personally do not think that using something and recognising that we are actually a city region in any way diminishes the special characteristics of the many areas that we have. We've got three main time towns in our conurbation city region and we've got 19 high streets. We've got, if you ask most people in any city where they lived, they would probably tell you the immediate vicinity of the suburb or area uh, it, it, which is closest to them. So I think it is probably uh, an exaggeration to say that using the word city term, which has been used for many years now, now, does anything to either lead the consultation or undermine any individual areas. On top of that, we have used the term city region in our big plan as administration because, as the chairman of the scrutiny board pointed out, it does um, uh, reflect a level of ambition that we can and should have for our area and that covers not just things like economic prosperity but things like the connectivity of getting around i, I think it, it it is very difficult for and my email box as many others is is flooded with people talking about the level of congestion we have pleading for things like a mass transit system or a metro system that is um, a reflection on the fact that we are a city region so you can't really have your cake and eat it i think is is the answer but fundamentally uh, government recognizes in that way 
and I think it's really important as we are talking about the geography that we live in that we do reflect reality. So um, I, I will not be taking forward that recommendation from our view and scrutiny board to change the document. Um, the, the second recommendation, however, I am uh, more than happy, and I did say this both in the um, local plan working group meetings and the overview and scrutiny board meeting, very happy to incorporate because I do think it is a, a really positive step. In particular, the you know, we, we, we have been for some time waiting for the findings of the local housing needs assessment. Uh, we'd always wanted to include that and the, the outcomes of that within the consultation, but it has been a joint piece of work with our colleagues in Dorset Council. We didn't have uh, the assurance that we would actually get that, pe that piece of work back in time. We have now um, had confirmation that we should have the draft findings of that um, before the consultation is released and therefore I have committed to the chairman of the Owens Group Board and the working plan local plan working group um, that we will have a further meeting of the local plan working group to consider those findings and if there are any recommendations that come out of that um, to try and incorporate those if possible within the uh, the consultation document. I think that's really important. I think um, explaining to people the, the findings of that independent report and, and flavouring the consultation with that is of course um, absolutely the right thing to do. Uh, one word of caution, however, um, uh, we, as, as the chairman uh, of the Owens Group Board has pointed out, we will continue using a myriad of different ways to, to look at how we can um, uh, reflect the, the reality of the, the housing uh, growth in the area. Uh, as, as we've talked about, the government are very insistent that we use a 2014 projection. I think it is only the right thing to do to prepare for that, because that is what governments say that we should do. But of course, there's a whole host of different ways um, that we're trying to um, uh, you know, reflect the reality of what we have in the ground. Um, as at a recent council meeting, uh, I talked about the fact that I'd written to the, uh, the Secretary of State and spoken to the Secretary of State on this matter. Uh, furthermore, as, as we've heard, there is some uh, really uh, important work going on at the moment using the 2014 projections, but looking at the detail behind them to again reflect what, what should come out of that 2014. I think that's a, a really novel way of not just saying to the government we completely disagree, but saying, you know, we could agree, but actually let's look a little bit deeper at the actual numbers. Uh, and then finally, and I think, you know, probably the most exciting now that we have our urban regeneration company up and running, we've got some really great experienced <laughs> minds within that, not least Gail Mayhew, who was one of the commissioners of government's Building Better, Building Beautiful Commission, which as we've heard only in the last few weeks, is now a centrepiece of the government's uh, future to look for planning, uh, we've now got one of the architects of that um, leading uh, you know, the, the kind of built environment conversations that we're having. And there could very well be a discussion within there about us being a, a pilot area and, and using the very special circumstances we've got to tackle this in a really productive joined up way. So a whole host of different ways that we're addressing the housing uh, numbers question. But in the interim, absolutely committed to uh, uh, putting the local housing needs assessment within the consultation consultation document, but also preparing um, for you know what we should be doing, which is coming forward with a local plan that actually meets the the government's criteria as we speak. Um, so on, on the back of that, Chairman, I would like to change the recommendation B uh, to reflect the commitment that I've made to the Overview and Scrutiny Board, and to change it to read uh, Cabinet delegate authority to the head of planning in consultation with the portfolio holder for regeneration, economy and strategic planning to make changes necessary to the plan prior to release for public consultation. Prior to the release of the plan for public consultation, the head of planning and portfolio holder will take into account any recommendation from the overview and scrutiny local plan working group once they have met to consider the findings of the local housing needs assessment. Chairman, a lot of work to do uh, in continuation of preparing the local plan, uh, but this is not the local plan. This is a consultation, and I'm really looking forward to finding out what local people think about the future of our area for the next 15 years. Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, comprehensive um, res response and uh, just for the record, I'm, I'm really happy to accept that changes uh, as I'm second in the paper. Um, uh, Councillor Barlow, is there anything you would like to um, uh, res respond in uh, effect to? I would just, I, I would really just like portfolio holder for accepting that second recommendation. Uh, it's a very important um, recommendation. I'm really pleased that he's taken it on board. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely, and just shows how we can work to work together collectively to to um, to, to good benefit. Okay. Um,
does anybody else wish to wish to speak on on the paper? I've got uh, Councillor Anger Mohan. Yeah, thank you, Chairman, and um, well, welcome the paper, and, and thank you to the Cabinet lead on this. Um, it, it, it's um, uh, there's only one point I wanted to make, which was you know often in the past where, where we've done these in our original councils, it's sometimes oh, it's just about the houses, and, uh, and and thank you. I think the cabinet members made clear this is the houses and considerably more than that. Uh, it's a more holistic picture of uh, BCP, and I think the um, the thing that almost I'm committing to as a portfolio holder for the things I oversee is that we need the cultural input in there. And I think now with the newly empowered cultural compact board and the campaign rolling um, with, with some with some momentum now is that we will be I'll be championing and we'll be making um, um, a, 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 a strong and articulate and hopefully um, a, a, an input in a form that can be taken into the local plan. And what I mean by this is a, a very, very clear sort of either requirement or wish or earnest hope around how we think about our built venues, how we think about our localities and how we think about our more open spaces so that they don't just enable cultural expression, but they actually actively encourage it as well. And it's absolutely essential we make this input. So the onus is on us to make that input into the local plan. But equally, I'm looking for the local plan, those who are administering it, to absolutely welcome that input and see how this kind of more intangible form of input can be incorporated fully. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mohan. And I've got uh, Councillor Rampton Karen. Yes, um, thank you, Chair. And uh, I do welcome this consultation and I thank uh, Councillor Broadhead for bringing it forward. Uh, the report says two of the key themes in the local plan will focus on the health and wellbeing agenda and uh, conservation of our biodiversity and our open spaces. And we all know about the lasting after effects of this pandemic, um, which have focused attention as never before on health and wellbeing. And having access to green space is part of maintaining um, our resident and our visitors health and wellbeing. So Chair, in September, um, I'm bringing a paper to Cabinet on extra care housing. And in that paper, we'll note that we will require more than a thousand extra care units in BCP with less requirements for the traditional um, model of residential care homes. And this is actually the new normal. People want care in and close to home. They want their own front door and a home for life where care and support can be provided where needed. And this is a drive as well, um, the national drive in health and social care to enable people to stay at home for as long as possible without having to go into hospital or care. So my ambition um, in my portfolio is to have an extra care village in BCP with a mix of housing types, a mix of tenure uh, and a, for a range of needs um, and all supported by state of the art tech enabled care. So Chair, what I'm getting around to saying is that we, I think we need to challenge ourselves on allocation of existing or proposed sites as employment land. And in particular, you won't be surprised at this, I'm referring to 4.3 in the report, which refers to Talbot Village. If we had an extra care village in that setting, it would have so it would have, it would have numerous benefits. Uh, and I believe it would still be compatible with the restrictions of the 400 metre zone. You could keep the existing small farm, which is much loved. It's a green lung in the middle of our conurbation. We could take advantage of all the intergenerational opportunities of the two existing universities and, of course, the communities um, around the housing communities with the existing housing. And very importantly, of course, it would protect our vital heathland and, uh, and our green spaces. And I know that in, um, employment land is really vital, but Chair, I don't believe it has to be there. So I'm making a plea that I, I know that we're not talking about specific sites in this paper, but it is mentioned uh, in here as, as, as keeping uh, that area as employment land. And I really would like us to think about that and challenge it. Thank you. 
Thank, thank you very much, Councillor Councillor Rampton. Uh, Phil, I believe you want to come back on on, on that point. Yes, Phil. thank you very much, Chair, and thank you, Councillor Rampton, uh, for for your thoughts on this. This is exactly the kind of conversation that we will need to be having when we get to the uh, st strategic preparation for the local plan. Because, as Councillor Rampton has pointed out, not only is everything interdependent and interconnected, and and that's where some local plans, um, as Councillor Enger has pointed out in the past, they they, they fail to recognise that it's all about where can we put our homes. But of course, it's about our economy. Economy. It's about the, our healthcare, and actually, you need to have a really uh, high-level, consolidated uh, uh, view of how all of this works in order to actually um, achieve the outcomes. Um, uh, is, as Councillor Rampton will know, I'm an absolutely huge fan of what has now been called later living, um, because I think there's a, a misconception among many people, uh, and I know um, a certain member of the previous administration called them um, uh, kind of old people's ghettos, which I think is is really unfair, because not only is this how, um, how how the world works now, um, but also as we're looking in that that strategic jigsaw puzzle of providing the right houses for the right people in the right location, um, a lot of the particularly the elder or older population um, often feel trapped in their own homes because the type of on, um, onward property that they want to buy is simply not available. And many areas of the country have demonstrated that if they have a really focused view on the local living offer in their area, what it actually does, the outcome of that is it frees up more family affordable family homes for families and for for for, for much younger people so actually the ability to um, it, it often seems counter to, um, uh, to to logic that the more homes you build for directly for the uh, the later living market, the, the more homes it actually frees up for younger people in the area. And it's those kind of interconnected consequences that we'll need to look at really carefully. Uh, not and as well as things like um, uh, you know the types of property that can be in areas where there's heathland mitigation. So that is the next step. So that will be the next stage of the plan. But um, as Councillor Rapson points out, this is the opportunity now to hear whether things things like that are important to people as we uh, start to uh, look at what, what what is important as we um, prepare the next steps. Yeah, uh, th thank you for that. I completely agree. I think, you know, it, it, in this uh, approach, it's, it's looking at it in the in, in that really um, strategic context, isn't it? And I think our URC um, should really help us, you know, really um, that interconnection and strategic thinking should really help us. We've got some, you know, um, internationally recognised people um, contributing to that now, which should, should should help us. And I think if we if we if we look at the new context we're in, which Camps, uh, Councillor Hampton, you know, referenced, um, the the, you know, the cherishing of green spaces uh, is hugely important. Was a massive, you know, uh, part of, of the last 12, 15 months. Um, yeah, and, and I think also we, we've heard a lot today about our climate and ecological emergency. So it's that consideration around, you know, where we're putting. Um, you know, economic development sites as well, and their connect connectivity. Certainly, a viewpoint of mine is, you know, it's got to be where there's good um, sustainable transport links as well. So, I think there is a there is a new context of what we're working in, and uh, this local plan consultation, um, we really encourage, you know, uh, that to be fed into it, and certainly we'll feed that in in in, in ourselves as well, um, because there's some good, you know good challenges and opportunities there. And, and just as an aside, I'm very very much looking forward to the paper in in September. It should be it should, a hugely exciting step forward for us. Um, OK, does, uh, I've got Councillor Jane Kelly. Jane. Thank you, Leader. Yes, actually, I just wanted to um, endorse um, what uh, Councillor Rappington has just described, and I too am really looking forward to this paper in September. I think in terms of our communities, we have to realise that um, we need to really think about how they would like to be living in their, in their old age, but also other people who are not necessarily elderly, but to have other disabilities or, or problems, and to to create a, a village like um, Councillor Rapton is describing would be absolutely amazing in one of the most beautiful parts of our conurbation as well. I really think that um, you know this needs to be taken forward, and I'm looking forward to seeing the paper and that it will be taken into consideration uh, in the local plan that we can do that kind of development, thinking about our communities and how they would like to live. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you very, thank you very much, Jane. Um, Nicola Green. Okay. 
Thank you, Lisa. Um, following on from the last three speakers, actually, I'd like to um, just go back to the bit, the discussion we were having earlier about um, equalities and how those are not an add on. They're not a nice to have. They're absolutely central to what we do in the same way. So as public health. Um, and I'm very pleased to see reference made to public health um, in this document um, and just want to say how central that is to any um, planning policy which we develop. Fresh air, exercise, access to good um, uh, to good public space is not just something that our grandmothers told us would make us feel better. There is data driving um, that that's, um, science that they always knew um, and telling us that this is absolutely vital to our to our well-being um, and to public health and therefore I'm really glad to see that mentioned in the report. The Health and Wellbeing Board have looked um, at the um, uh, the development of the local plan um, in its early stages um, in an informal session and I know that um, our health pe um, partners are um, very keen to continue to be consulted and therefore I am looking forward very much to a really rounded discussion about this because it really is, as Councillor Kelly says, about designing the right spaces for all our communities. Thank you very much, absolutely. Okay, um, Phil, is anything you'd like to uh, say and sum up before I move to the vote? I just say thank you very much for all the uh, the, the comments on this. I'm um, really looking forward to seeing how the consultation is going to go. Um, one thing I didn't mention is that um, our colleagues in, in Dorset Council uh, have, have done their consultation slightly before us, so we're working really closely with them to find uh, all of the good practice that they've done. Theirs was a digital only consultation. Um, I don't think we'll be going uh, that far, but actually some of the lessons that they've learned from that of how to get to communities that we've sometimes missed, yeah. to reference that last point, uh, I think will be really good lessons to learn so uh, last plea from me is for the public we you know th this this is really important let's hear your views on some of the the choices that we've got ahead of us uh, we can all do this together we've got some fantastic opportunities in the place that we've got um, and, and now's the time to take it to the next level um, so happy to pose with the uh, amended recommendation that i'd um, uh, talked about earlier Great, thank you. And just check with Democratic, we're happy we've got the wording for the uh, amendment. Yeah, great. OK, um, so I'm happy to take that to vote then. So um, all those in favour, please show. Again, that's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. for. OK, that moves us now to um, agenda item 10, which is a housing management model review. Um, so I believe it's uh, Councillor Bob Lawton. Thank you, Leader. <coughs> This is an exciting paper which I'm bringing forward to Cabinet today. Excuse my voice, I'm losing it. <clears throat> this is a paper seeking uh, permission to go out to consultation on the various housing options which, have, uh, which operate between the pool and Bournemouth area. It doesn't affect Christchurch as their how all of their housing is operated by a company called Sovereign. What we're looking at is a combined Within the, within the council operation, which will be a hybrid and give us the best of both worlds. Can I just explain to people that the pool, we have two systems of housing within the area. The pool housing partnership is operated as an arm length or management organization, and the council housing within Bournemouth is operated by the council. What we're looking at is bringing them two together. The council has a legal obligation to operate one HRA or housing revenue account. We have two, one operates in Poole and one operates in Bournemouth. What we'd be looking to do is obviously bring them together. The housing revenue account has approximately 43 million pounds worth of value. The other reason for bringing the services together, and I should bring this into the national context, the government have taken a strong interest in housing over a number of years, but especially since the unfortunate events which happened in Grenfell. One of the things that they brought forward is a white paper, which is called the Charter for Social Housing Residents. And I, as a councillor, am looking after homes for Bournemouth, Poole and Christchurch, are insure, will make sure that we are legally uh, safe and make sure we uh, meet those legal requirements. The Charter sets out several legal requirements. One, to be safe in your home, to know how your landlord is performing, to have your complaints dealt with promptly and fairly, to be treated with respect, to have your voice heard by your landlord, to have a good quality home and neighbourhood to live in, to be supported to take your first steps towards home ownership. 
this is a very extremely comprehensive uh, uh, consultation which we're carrying out. We're asking for people's views on what they think would be the best service to give them in Poole and Christchurch and how we handle homes in general across the council. And I highly recommend it to the cabinet. Thank you, Leader. Thank, thank you very much. That's, uh, that's great. And I believe we're going to Councillor Rampton to um, second character. I am. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, just a couple of comments. Um, I'm very happy to support this paper. Uh, going out to consultation on a completely new model um, for BCP uh, Council and, and one that aims to put both tenants and leaseholders at the heart of housing management, which is exactly how it should be. So I really hope that people engage with this consultation and give us their views and look forward to this coming back. Going back to cabinet, councillor Lodge. Yes, it is. Yes. Thank you. Right. Okay. Thank you very much, both. So, do any members uh, wish to wish to speak to the paper, uh, councillor Mike Green? Thank you, thank you, leader. Just uh, a, a quick question. Um, the report, obviously, at the moment, because it's just a case of going out to to consultation um, on the options available, doesn't refer references to the, the, the financial implications. Um, I, I presume I'm right in saying that they'll be taken into account as we come to a, a, a final decision on this? Uh, thank you, Councillor Green. Uh, yes, they will. Uh, we have had a, an initial stab through our uh, independent analysis um, uh, consultant who has given us some, some figures. Uh, but I must emphasize that the reason we're doing this is A, to make us legally uh, compliant, but it's not the reason why we're doing this is to save money, although there will be money saved. That is not the driving force. The driving force is primarily to give us the best service possible for the residents of Bournemouth and Poole. Yeah, Mike. Right. Th 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 thanks very much. And I guess it, it's key to note that because this is all within the housing revenue account, um, any, any money saved or spent would, of course, be for the benefit of our council tenants uh, alone rather than it being um, allowed outside in here. So it's very much uh, from what you're saying about making sure we get the best solution um, across all of the different uh, different elements of it, whether financial, whether governance and everything else uh, for those uh, those council tenants. Yeah. Yeah. Can I thank you, Councillor Green? Yeah, exactly. I should have said, made that point. Any savings which are which are manifest themselves during the investigation will be totally reinvested in the pool and Christchurch and Bournemouth housing for the benefits of the tenants. Great, thank you very much uh, uh, both. And uh, can I just apologise to the Chair of Overview and Scrutiny, I should have come to you before I opened up to, 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 to Cabinet, my mistake. Uh, Steve, would you like to um, uh, come in? Yeah, yeah, thank you, Leader. Uh, for this uh, pr uh, paper, um, there was one exception uh, where uh, the case for the combined hybrid service was considered to be not proven. However, that wasn't the view of the majority on the board who have uh, overall support for the paper. Thank you. Thank you. OK, do any other members of, of, uh, of Cabinet wish to, wish to speak on, on this? Oh, it's fine. So with that, I'll move to the vote. And so all those in favour, please show. Thank you. That's again, again unanimous. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Councillor Lawson, for that so, uh, excellent piece of work coming forward. We move now to agenda item 11, which is the Cabinet Forward Plan, um, and the latest version was published on the 3rd of August. Uh, sorry, will be published um, on the 3rd of August. The, I, I'll move over to uh, Sarah Colwick in Democratic Services. We also need to, um, I believe, note the urgent decisions that have been made um, by the Chief Executive. Sarah. Thank you. Yes, just to um, please note, Cabinet, that there have been um, two recent um, urgent delegated decisions. One is titled Urgent Sustainable Fleet Replacement Procurement. The other one was the COVID Local Support Grant extension to end of September 2021. Um, these are published on the Council's website. In addition, um, another decision has been published today, this morning. Um, this is titled Additional Restrictions Grants ARG4, okay, which is also published on the Council website and will be also reported to council in future at cabinet meetings we will have a standard item on the agenda that will deal with any urgent delegated decision items 
Great, OK, thank you. And um, we've been in full consultation with the Chief Exec around, that, around those decisions as well. Um, OK, so without uh, with that, um, then that uh, closes our business today. So thank you to uh, uh, colleagues for, for, your, um, for your papers and your involvement. Thank you particularly to any members of the public who, who are engaged um, um, with us today or looking back later. We very much look forward to, um, to, to seeing you again. And with that, I'm very happy to close the meeting. Thank you.